Hello, Church at the Red Door family. Hello, friends. Welcome to our Sunday morning broadcast. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. What a gorgeous day it is out today. A beautiful Sunday. And I hope all of you are enjoying the Sunday. And particularly, I know you're going to enjoy this particular broadcast. We have some special things for you today. Uh, and by the way, last Wednesday, I hope there were many of you that tuned in to our Wednesday night service last Wednesday, which was Ash Wednesday, start of Lent. And, uh, you know, whether or not you follow the liturgical calendar or you have a Lent devotion, just stop to recognize and stop to think a minute about the purpose of Lent is to prepare our hearts for Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, April 4th. That's what it's all about, friends. So we just pray that over these next few weeks, you will take time to go a little bit closer, a little bit deeper in the Word with our Lord and get your heart set for Easter Sunday and Resurrection of Sunday celebration of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be an awesome Sunday. Hey, listen, Jeff uh, is continuing today a little bit from last Sunday. Uh, it's not quite, uh, he's not going to move quite as far along as, as he thought last Sunday, for this Sunday. But he's got a, a very stirring message. He's going to be talking about the seen realm, the unseen realm, and the demonic realm. And how all of that kind of fits in and why we maybe have so much chaos in this world today. It's going to be really intriguing. It's going to be a stirring message. So get your Bibles out. He's going to be moving around in some various different uh, verses, but, uh, different books, books of the Bible. So be prepared for this. It's going to be a, a great, fantastic message. All right. And during the message, we have some special guests that Jeff is going to introduce, Mike and Lisa Major. Uh, again, uh, great volunteers and part of our community and family here at Church at the Red Door. So welcome them, if you would, please when they come as Jeff introduces them. And then I also want to remind you of this coming Wednesday night. Uh, please join us, 6 o'clock Pacific time Wednesday night, and we broadcast The Living Room. And Pastor Paul will have another uh, message for us uh, on Wednesday night. He's going to be talking about Jesus is the door. Tune in to find out all about that. And also, we're going to be interviewing Mike Groves, about Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, another fantastic ministry here in the Valley. Uh, just bringing, uh, bringing people in as a special program to walk them through a journey in faith, as well as uh, give them housing and food and all the other uh, things that might be required for those that are uh, homeless right now or really uh, in an environment where they're, just, they're kind of hurting and they just need a lot of help. So join us Wednesday night, Pastor Paul, Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, I know it's going to be uh, very informative for you. All right, uh, I'm going to close up now this open up our service with prayer, and then we'll move on in to some worship time. Okay, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we gather once again on uh, Sunday here at Church at the Red Door, Father, to honor you, to come together as a family, as a community, and worship. And Lord, to hear your word, so we pray for uh, Pastor Jeff as he brings your word forth today. Father, we pray your Holy Spirit would uh, superintend and shepherd that all the way to our hearts. Father, that it would touch our hearts and transform us today. Lord, we pray for all those that have joined us, and in particular those, Lord, that are seeking. Uh, they're seeking you. Or Lord, those that are hurting today and just looking for a comfort and a message and to be in your word. So. Lord, we pray for everybody here that's joined us this morning. Cover us, bless us, and Lord, we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now, friends, join me as we move on into some worship time. Thank you, and God bless. Good morning, Church the Red Door. Uh, Mr. Lenticum, thank you very much, and I uh, hope, hope, hope you enjoyed that worship. Uh, Pete uh, Dine has been doing an incredible job of selecting our worship. So thank you for that, Pete. I really appreciate you, friend, as does the entire CRD community. Uh, are you ready to roll this morning? I, I'm i excited about this morning. I'm excited about every morning. Why? Because it's the Word. It's a life-transforming Word. It's the sword of the Spirit. It does its surgery on the interior of our hearts. Uh, it's transformative. And uh, so for that reason, I'm excited, and I will be excited the following week, and the following week, and the following week, 
until either Jesus comes back or the Lord takes me home. So uh, anyway, hope you're ready to roll and we're gonna get going here this morning. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you've hung in there with me on this chapter four. Uh, it may actually, as I started to kind of work through this the last few days, you know, I've got to send out your missive early and sometimes it doesn't quite end up fitting exactly where I'm going to go that week and yet I do the best I can and I try to stick to that and we will definitely get to the healing. I'm not so sure we're going to get to what I've kind of called the second act or the second demonstration, I actually should say, of Jesus' power and fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 61 that we looked at last week. Number one, his control and authority over the demonic realm. And again, what is the demonic realm? It's the fallen angelic realm uh, that is set as an adversary with the ultimate adversary being the adversary, but all his minions set to destroy the earth. And, you know, people struggle with this. I mean, we live in a materialistic worldview. People often talk about, well, I can't see it, therefore I don't believe it. If I can't quantify it, if I can't put it into a scientific laboratory and make sure it exists, then uh, I'm not going to believe in it. And yet we struggle uh, to make sense of all the chaos and disorder and tyranny that we see all around us in a fallen earth. And so the demonic realm fits the bill for me. It fits the bill. It makes, it gives explanation why human beings created in the image of God, according to the Bible, why human beings can cause such terror and chaos. We don't see that in the animal kingdom. We don't see uh, plots of revenge. We don't see malice. We don't see, we see territorial activity. We see tooth and claw. We see animals trying to feed themselves, but they don't just go out and try to disrupt all the behavior around them. Uh, all, the, all the other rest of the animal kingdom for no purpose or no reason. There's always an instinctual, an instinctive reaction. We can't make sense of why human beings act as they do with such uh, animosity and such revenge and such hatred towards other human beings. And we have to understand the demonic realm influencing humankind is the reason for that. And so for me, if you want to think of it scientifically, it fits until we understand and maybe get a better understanding um, when, we're, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign. But it, it, make, it gives a very uh, quantifiable explanation uh, for the evil that we see around us. And so I want to kind of move forward this morning, but before I do, I told you last week that I want to give an explanation, and I think Derek Prince really helped me understand this uh, in a very profound way. He wrote a book uh, called Lucifer Exposed. I've actually quoted from it a few times. It gave me some real insight, and, and there are other places that you can get insight. Some of you have probably read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, giving some, uh, again, uh, uh, the way that the demonic thinks and the way humans are so frail and how we give in so easily into temptation. But listen to what he says about the following. And the question is, why the hatred of the demonic realm towards mankind? Maybe you can say, I can understand because they have, uh, of the, uh, the judgment that's come down from on high, why they would have such an animosity towards their creator. But why humankind? And I think Derek Prince gives two very sound explanations. And I want to read this to you really quickly. First of all, he says, uh, he could attack, first of all, he could attack God's image in man. In other words, Satan, the adversary. You see, man visibly represented God to the rest of creation. Satan could not touch God himself, but he could make war against the very image of God within man. Again, think of that. Satan, he realizes he's completely outgunned as it relates to God. I mean, he is, in fact, a created being. But seeing the image of God, how would he get back? You see that often in dramas or something, you know? Someone wants to get back at somebody. They know they can't touch him, so they'll go after their family or they'll go after their progeny or go after somebody that they care about. And that's exactly, I think, what he's saying here about one of the purposes uh, that Satan and the adversary, the adversary is so, has so much angst against us as the human beings. Why? Because we're created in God's image. Uh, his delight was to defile that image, to destroy it, to humiliate it. And to that end, he worked tirelessly. And so we can see that. Uh, why do we see? We see humans subject to shame and humiliation all day, every day around us. Watch media, watch 
just the open shame that we subject ourselves to, what's the power behind that? It just can't be explained uh, purely from a materialistic evolutionary model. It, d it demands design, and in this sense, the design was man created in the image of God. There are spiritual unseen forces that very powerfully come after mankind. And we'll see a little bit more of that this morning. How do they do that? By inhabiting in terms of total, the totality of demonic possession, but also influence. And, and I can tell you, I feel that influence as you do. And we've talked uh, over the last few weeks about how we can fight the temptations that come our way. Prayerfully, we do it in, with increasing success. And as a result, it has a powerful influence and impact. So now what I want to shift to is the second reason why Satan is after mankind. Second reason Satan has such malice to man was due to the fact that man was destined to take Satan's place of dominion. If you don't understand that, you're not even gonna understand the reason for which you're on the planet. We were called as human beings to be fruitful and multiply and to take dominion. We are in fact to bring, pray in, actively seek to bring God's kingdom to earth. We talk about that virtually every week. From the moment of man's creation, Satan saw him, man that is, as a rival that he needed to eliminate in terms of dominion. Now you've got to understand that the adversary has limited dominion over mankind, limited dominion, and it is has a short lifespan on it. That he knows, and that's what we talked about last week, there will be an ultimate reckoning for not only fallen humanity that has not reestablished themselves in Jesus, but also for the demonic realm. They have already and already are being destroyed. Again, we saw 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus said, the, the, uh, John said the purpose for Jesus was to destroy the works of the enemy, destroy the works of the devil. Those are, were destroyed at the cross, and in, in a final uh, chapter, when the final chapter is uh, written, but up until now, they are being destroyed, and we continue to carry on that destruction of Satan's works, and we want to limit his dominion. That's why we take the gospel. That's why we're doing this right now. That's why we're engaged in the propagation, the advancement of the kingdom through the gospel of Jesus. And that purpose is very simple. The purpose is to destroy the works of the devil. So we are involved in the very same thing that Jesus was involved in, he is now authenticating who he claimed to be by these two things, casting out the demonic, and that I think as we'll see a little bit more next week, through the process of actually healing disease, taking authority over the physical realm as well. So what Jesus is doing in two ways, he's taking authority over the unseen realm, and then in healing disease, he's taking authority over the seen realm. And that's important to understand. It is authenticating the very claims for which he has made. So when he stood up again, let me just reiterate, when he stood up again in that synagogue in Nazareth, read Isaiah 61, he was very clearly making a claim to divine authority. And that then was authenticated. It was enacted by addressing this unseen realm through the demonic realm, taking authority, and then taking authority over the physical realm through the miraculous things that he did, not the least of which was healing, but there was also walking across the water, turning the water into wine. He was taking control over the materialistic world. Now you've got to understand, folks, Jesus was not just a teacher. He was not a guru. He was, he was the ultimate teacher, but he was not simply a teacher. He is our wisdom. He is our knowledge, according to Paul's letter to the Colossians. But Jesus very clearly has authority over all realms, seen, unseen, and otherwise irrespective of how many dimensions we ever determine there are, maybe string theory posits 11 or 21 or whatever it's going to be, all dimensions, Jesus has authority. Why? Because he's the creator of everything, and he is now making that claim. So last week, again, we looked at the time was not the ultimate destruction, but the, the finality of the cross guaranteed their ultimate destruction, and from now until Jesus comes back to set all things right, the process is the destruction of Satan's works. Now, Satan is still active. Jesus asks even the question, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And so, again, part of our calling as followers of Jesus is to make sure the world knows 
that Jesus is in fact the king of the cosmos and to enter into relationship. Now the second part of that, and I told you last week, there are two important things that I want to look at as it relates to Jesus' interaction with the unseen realm, with the demonic realm. And the second of those two things is to recognize that the demonic realm knew exactly who Jesus was. Now, address this briefly last week, and I want to go into this a little bit more now. So I'm going to take you forward. We're not going to actually look at the Lukean account, which is in Luke chapter 8, but we're going to look at Matthew's account of an interaction. We'll, we'll come to this again in, in future weeks, but I want to look at it now. I want to look at this incident that happens when Jesus is casting out uh, this legion of demons, in fact, uh, from these uh, demoniacs that live in the Gadarenes. So we're going to go to the Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 through 34. Now I'm going to kind of read a few verses and then we're going to unpack it and we're going to look at this in great detail this morning. So verse 28, when he, Jesus that is, came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes. Now what is the other side? We looked last week, he was doing his ministry at, in Capernaum. On the other side of the Sea of Galilee is an area that was primarily Gentiles, not exclusively, but primarily Gentiles, called the Gadarenes. And if you go on that area and then south, you end up in Decapolis, and this was a Gentile region, primarily. So he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes. Two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. Where were these two guys living? They were living in the tombs. Let me just tell you, that's what Satan, Satan feasts on. He loves to live among death. Why? Because he has a death warrant on his life. He knows it's limited. And so people possessed by him, it it's not, shouldn't be surprising that they live among the tombs. Says they were so extremely violent. One of the things that we see clearly as evidence of satanic activity is violence. And so they were extremely violent, the Matthew account says, and no one could pass by that way. Why? Because they would come after them. They would try to destroy them. This is what Satan does. He is again destroying the image of God in humankind. Hated the, the bodies that they were possessing and hated any other human beings that might be passing by. Now these demons, or these demoniacs, they cried out, saying, but it was the demons speaking through these men, what business do we have with each other? Now catch this, what does they say? Son of God. Now you have to understand that the demonic realm, they understand exactly as we said last week, who Jesus was. Jesus of Nazareth, what do you have to do with this? Jesus, son of the living God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Again, when they're talking about the time, they know that their time is limited and there is coming an ultimate destruction. A casting, uh, they will be cast into a place of fire forever and ever. The Bible's very clear. And now we get into 30 and then I'm going to come back and repack some of this. Verse 30 says, there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. I think it's the Mark's account gives us an actual number of the swine. There were 2,000 pigs that were involved in this incident. And the demons began to entreat Jesus, saying, if you're going to cast us out, send us into that herd of swine. Now, there's a lot of, well, well, let me finish the story and we'll come back. And he said to them, go. And they came out, went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. The herdsmen ran away and went to the, into the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. In other words, they were free. They were in their right mind. They were, they were no longer attacking people. They were what? What was happening here? I'll tell you exactly what was happening. Exactly what the prophet Isaiah had seen would happen, proclaiming liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. How was that enacted? It was enacted by addressing the unseen realm, those possessed either by specifically by the demonic or the influence, those who are influenced by the demonic, which would be all of us in some ways. And that's why we are being transformed. It is an ongoing process that Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy written by Isaiah that he, again, last week we saw, stood up in that synagogue and claimed, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. This is the outworking of that. They were in their right mind. Can, I just want you to stop for a second. 
Can you imagine the picture? I mean, where were these people's parents? Maybe they didn't even know. Maybe they had long since lost track of these, of these two men. Uh, wh- wh- what about their friends? Did they have any friends? Did they ever have any friends? How, how did they get in this position? What, what open door in their lives gave way to? Was it, was it uh, some kind of addiction? Was it, was it a sexual addiction or a substance addiction? Or, or was it, what was it that gave entrance to a legion this is a huge number of, of demons that were actually residing in these two men. And now they're sitting in their right mind. Everything is copacetic again. It's, they're in a beautiful place. In fact, as we'll see another, in another account, they, they wanted to begin to follow Jesus immediately. I mean, they, they went from harming people, extremely violent, to wanting to serve the, to the king of the cosmos. They went into the city and they claimed this is what had happened to the demoniacs. And then finally, verse 34, and behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they implored him to leave the region. Now we'll talk about that in a minute as well. To leave? <laughs> what are you talking about? Why would you leave? They've just seen something extraordinary. They've seen, they've seen uh, this had to be a blight on this whole entire community. These these demoniacs living among the tombs trying to attack anybody who came by, why would they be asking them to leave, Jesus to leave? They should be imploring him to stay. But they said, please leave. I'm going to give you an explanation of of that as well. Uh, So first of all, why would it be? Let's talk first about the Son of God. Why, why, Why? How did they know? Well, you need to understand, and James speaks to this very specifically in the New Testament. In James chapter 2, verse 19, it said, You believe that God is one. Well, you do well. The demons also believe. And they shudder. Now, I don't have time to get into the, the fact that the, demonics, the, uh, the demonic realm doesn't have an opportunity to be restored by belief into Jesus. But let me tell you something. They absolutely believe. Their theology is correct. <laughs> They understand that Jesus was the the Holy One. That's what they just called him. They understood a lot about who Jesus was, that he was the creator. They they bowed before. They were terrified of him, and rightfully so. So much of their theology was in place, unlike our culture today that doesn't even believe in a creator, can look around and see the design elements in all of creation and say, ah, just by chance. We don't know where it came from. It just kind of popped into nowhere. But their their theology is much more sound. But what's going on here? How how did they know? I think it's an, I think it's important to see Jesus, the Son of God. Well, first of all, we have to understand that belief and is not is not simply saying something, because and this is what happens with human beings. I think about, for instance, Peter in Matthew chapter sixteen. Uh, we looked at it a number of weeks back in another context. But Peter, uh, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, thou art Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said, well, that's good, Peter, but it was the Holy Spirit that helped you understand this. He put the word. So what Jesus was really saying is that, Peter, these words, you're speaking the words of God. You are Amazing, you're calling me Christ, the son of the living God. And then the very next incident we get is that Jesus begins to talk about his death, his imminent death, and Peter, how does he respond? He says, I'll never let you go to the cross. And Peter says, what? He says, I'll never let you go to the cross. And Jesus then turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Now, was Satan really there or was Satan influencing? Was this a demonic possession at that moment? I don't believe it was a demonic possession. I don't think there had to be any kind of exorcism that happened. But certainly Peter was being influenced by Satan. So Jesus was able to say, get behind me, adversary. Get behind me. You're setting your interests on man's interest and not on God's as we had seen. Now, how is this relevant? Well, Jesus had said, uh, Peter, you're this little pebble. You're not the ultimate rock. I'm the rock. This truth is the rock. But Peter, you're this little rock, this little pebble, and upon this bigger truth of what you just said, I'm going to build my church. So Peter goes from rock, and in the very next incident, what happened? He goes to block. He goes to stumbling block. Get behind me, you're a stumbling block to me because you're setting your interests on man. So here's Peter. 
Here's Peter clearly believing into Jesus and yet still complicit with the activities of Satan in the very next incident that we see in Matthew chapter 16. Such is the case with humanity. Sometimes out of my mouth can come the very, come the very words of God. How? Through the Holy Spirit and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And in the very next moment, I can be used or influenced by Satan to bring death or destruction through a comment or an action against someone, maybe that I even love or someone that I don't know. But it, that is this horror show that it, that is sometimes humanity. It's so challenging to, to be speaking the words of God on a more and more consistent basis, to be empowered and used by the Holy Spirit. And on the next hand, to grieve the Spirit of God that lives in us and actually be influenced and be a, be a source that Satan can use to bring destruction. It shouldn't be this way. It's a little bit what the New Testament talks about. You, it, it shouldn't be that dirty water and spring, clear spring water come out of the same spring. shouldn't be. A good tree and a bad, you can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. This is the Matthew 7. You'll know them by their fruits, but what about the hu human condition that sometimes we are complicit with the adversary's activities? Well, they're not in that situation. The, demonics, uh, the, the demonic realm is not in that situation. There is no place at all for them to ever, that we know anything about, for restoration among the demonic realm. They made a decision. There's no redemption possible, no ransom possible. And we'll see this next week as, again, Jesus takes an Isaiah's prophecy and takes a redemption and a ransom position and says, I'm going to be the one that actually offers that. So Jesus is not offering that, but they are believing who Jesus is. Well, is that salvific? In other words, does that lead to salvation? They believe. Do you have any friends or maybe some of your family? You talk to them about Jesus or you want to talk to them about faith and what's often what's the response? Well, I believe in God. What would James say? <laughs> well, uh, they believe in the Shema. Have you ever heard of the Shema? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What James is really doing is a takeoff on the Shema down here. He's saying you believe that God is one. In other words, James was speaking to the Jewish community and they were saying, you know, you believe that God is one, congratulations. You're quoting the Shema. But you've got to understand the, de the, the demonic realm, they believe that God is one and they shudder. They knew exactly who Jesus was. Some people have a general sense or maybe they feel like they can recite some kind of Christian creed or some kind of, you know, kind of mystical statement, make one claim. Maybe, you know, the sinner's prayer is very important. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes when people just say, I'll just say the words. Just tell me the words to say and then I'll go back to my kingdom. And that is a tragic place to be because even the demonic realm believes that Jesus, that God is one and they shudder. But there has to be something deeper and it is always based on a relationship with the living God. So back to our story here. Why the, why the asking to be cast into the swine? What, what was this? They recognized that they had no authority relative to Jesus' authority. Is now the time? Is it the ultimate time? Well, it wasn't evidently the ultimate time. They begged. Why did they beg to be cast into this uh, herd of swine? Why did they beg for that? Because the demonic realm does not want to be... Uh, without uh, an ability to inhabit some kind of uh, life form. They don't want to just wander aimlessly with no ability to engage the seen realm. Uh, that's why uh, having a body is so significant. I'm glad I have a body. I'm able to have vocal cords, eyeballs. I'm able to speak to this camera this morning. Uh, I'm able to talk and engage and, and hug and love and and, and eat food and enjoy many of the things that God has blessed us with. I couldn't do that as an uninhabited spirit. 
And then, so they wanted some kind of, and then, you know, I can imagine the scene. They just looked around and they say, throw us into those swine. Now, a lot of people read things into this, and I'm, I'm not so sure the text would give us that kind of latitude, but some people think, well, maybe, maybe this was, uh, although this was a, typically a Gentile area on the other side of the Galilee, maybe these were some Jewish uh, people who owned these swine, and Jesus was uh, giving some kind of a comment about their, uh, they were told through the, uh, the Levitical law not to you know, have anything to do with swine to this day. Uh, most, many observant Jews uh, don't have anything to do with, with, with swine, with pigs. And, and, and yet, well, maybe that was it. I don't know. I think that's a stretch. I think these were probably Gentiles that owned these swine. I, why the swine? I think I just think it was immediate there. I don't know that they're trying to. This is some symbolic act. It could have been, but I want you to think two thousand. A herd of two thousand. This was a lot of money back then, and in an agrarian culture like it was, I think there's mo- something more specific here that we need to look at. They were then cast into the sea and drowned. The pigs drowned, and so again they're aim- aimlessly wandering. So he cast them in, gave them their request, and then again they're back to uh, uninhabited. Uh, spirit beings, which are the demonic realm. So that was the case. Now, what I find more interesting in the story and probably the most challenging part of the story as it relates to a teachable moment through this, why did they ask Jesus to leave? I mean, again, this is a life-giving, transformative, miracle-working. Certainly they had heard the stories. It was just across the a uh, little Sea of Galilee here. Certainly they had heard the stories of healings and, and this, this new person on the scene and it's, it's amazing. I mean, they didn't have internet and social media, but I can promise you, word spread quickly. Why would they beg him to leave? Some speculate, I think John Piper speculate, has I've read, has speculated before that maybe this was an issue of Jesus was confronting their own wealth. See, what they were terrified of was not so much his authority because the authority led to a a beautifying of their community. No more violent men running through the tombs trying to attack anybody who came near. Be like getting rid of an angry dog, uh, attack dogs that that were plaguing a whole community. People would applaud that. That would be wonderful. Unless it cost them in their pocketbook. You know, I think this is probably a pretty good insight into this incident. I I think what we're getting here is that they said, wow, this has cost us 2,000 swine. We don't want to lose any more wealth, even if it means, even if it means asking the very creator of the cosmos, which they may not have been there in their understanding, but this obvious miracle worker who's brought great uh, peace and shalom to our area we still care more about our money. And I'm going to tell you folks, this still, if this is a, a proper interpretive view, and I think, it's, I think it's probably pretty solid, I think this is still the case. You know, we're fine with the Jesus stuff as long as it doesn't cost us in our pocketbooks, as long as it doesn't cost us anything, we're fine to have a, maybe a new church down the road. or so, But don't ask me to give to it, or don't ask me to get involved in that ministry to the poor. Don't get asked me... We're fine with Jesus, but just don't have it affect me in any way. And please uh, leave us. Uh, Leave us. And we wouldn't maybe say that, but I think that's certainly the case with many people. So again, our second point here this morning, which I think is critical to understand, is that the demonic realm understood exactly who Jesus was. They knew he was the son of God. They knew, in fact, he was the creator of, in fact, they knew they were, he was their creator and they were terrified. They had a healthy fear of the Lord, clearly. So, again, back to James. So, does quoting the Shema, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or, or reciting a creed or some anything Christian today, is just the recitation of that, is that saving? Is that saving? Or is it something deeper than that? I think it's something deeper. I'm now going to have some of our dear friends, uh, head of our security, and, and my, Mike and Lisa Majors, if they wouldn't mind reading a series of verses out of Peter, and then we're going to kind of break this down to close this morning. First Peter, first chapter of First Peter, 
uh, and I'm going to have them read verse 8, verse 15, and then also verses 22 and 23. So uh, Mike and Lisa, so good to have you with us this morning. Go ahead and read those passages for the community. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, Church at the Red Door. Mike and Lisa Major here from our home in La Quinta. It's our privilege and pleasure this morning to read scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 15 and 22 to 23. All right, let's begin with uh, verse 8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you have not seen him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Verse 15, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Verses 22 and 23, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. We miss you, Church at the Red Door. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Mike and Lisa. Appreciate that. Now, notice the progression here. This is, this is the case with anybody. Anybody can quote something. Demons can just believe. Anybody can say, well, I believe in God. What's the, what is the clarifying distinction between someone who would just claim to believe or recite belief or just kind of have a generalized belief? We'll call it theistic they have a theistic position. There must be a creator out there, but they don't then take a next step to engage the words in the ministry of Jesus so that, so that Jesus can proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. So we don't have to be enslaved to sin anymore. How does that go? Well, Mike and Lisa just allowed us to see this through this reading of 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to pick out this kind of progression again. So to requote what Mike and Lisa just read, Though you've not seen him, verse 8, you love him, and though you don't see him now, but you believe in him. Okay, so step number one, you don't see Jesus anymore. I've never physically seen Jesus before. I can feel his presence. I, I can read this scripture. I can, I can read the word, and I know this is, uh, this is like we looked at last week. This is with authority. There's something radically different about what we see in Jesus' words, radically different. So I know that. I've not seen him, but I, I believe in him. So step number one is though, yeah, I don't see him, but I, I believe in him. I see the effects he ha has had on not only my life, but on the lives of others. And when I first heard the gospel, it just resonated with me. That's right. That's true. That's, that's the state of my soul. That's the state of my heart. I can, I can sense it. What you're saying is, as much as I don't like to hear it, it's right. I'm a deceitful person. I, I need salvation. And then secondly, you, re, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, but like the Holy One who called you. Okay, so here's the distinction between the demonic realm and recognizing Jesus. Here's where it, it's over, okay? So they believe in him. They get the first part right, but here's where the roads dissect. You ready? And it's true for you this morning as well. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus or a believer into Jesus or just a God conscious person, take this road and here's this road. This road just says, well, I believe. Well, so do the, so do the demons and they shudder. But take this road and are you ready? Like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. In other words, a whole lifestyle begins. There is a pursuit of righteousness. We're clothed in it immediately, but then we have to actualize it. We have to pursue it. So be holy yourselves in all your behavior. I, I'm, I wish it said, you know, in parts of your behavior that you feel like you want to turn over to the Lord or you need help, but it's all of our behavior. That's challenging. Sometimes I get so discouraged when I feel like I'm falling so short and I have to Go back to the text and say, well, God's full of love and full of grace. Get back up. A righteous man falls seven times. He keeps getting up. Keep submitting yourself, a desire to be holy. That's, that's a big indication. That is a very different road than, well, I believe in God generally, but I like doing my own thing. It says, be, in all your behavior, 
since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. There's a purification process. That's what being holy, becoming more holy is, is a purifying process. I think that was another reason that the demons wanted to be cast into the swine. Demons are filthy. They're impure. The swine themselves were completely and utterly impure through the Levitical law. Now we kind of understand a little bit about that. You know, that pigs are impure. And I won't give you all the reasons they're impure. Many of you will know enough about that to know why that's the case. They were, they were the impure. They were the unholy. They were the unclean. And they were being asked to be cast into the impure, the unholy, and the unclean, at least from a Levitical law perspective. For a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So what happens is we believe. And then we begin the purification process. So that what? So that we can love one another. I mean, that's the point. If, I, if I'm still unclean and impure, I'm only going to love Jeff. But as the purification process starts, I find that, again, my desires change and I find myself loving other people. Look, if you still... If you, if you say, well, I've been following Jesus my whole life and deep down you really realize you don't, just don't, you don't love anybody but maybe those who give to you, well, that's not a big deal. Uh, or family, that's not a big deal. Even non-believers do that. But you find a discernible and distinctively different love for people that you have nothing in common with, that aren't able to give you anything. You just have a love for humanity. Can you not see, my friends, that this is a huge distinction. What does Satan do? Satan hates humankind. He hates the image of God in people. He hates it. He wants it to humiliate it and to shame it. We are put on a course, not just believe in God. Anybody, demons believe. But we're put on a course of purification so that we might fervently love one another. So when we see the image of God, one of the reasons that we care about anyone, any human being, regardless of how filthy they may have become by this world, uh, regardless of how they may have failed, regardless of whatever, we still see the Imago Dei. We see the image of God in them. And as a result, through the purification of Jesus and a relationship with him, we begin finding ourselves loving the unlovable. Why was Hitler so different? Well, he really wasn't. He was a manifestation, a personification. He clearly, I, there's no question in my mind, Hitler was demon-possessed, as were many of his cohorts. And what did they want to do? They wanted to humiliate and shame. Look what they did among the Jewish people, and not merely the Jewish people, primarily the Jewish people, but many people that weren't part of their Aryan race. What did they do? They, these are all clear signs of the demonic. They hated humankind. They wanted to shame, humiliate, belittle, and ultimately destroy the image of God that was in, in creation. See it over and over. So we, we do that. We fervently love one another from the heart. Why? Because we've been born again of seed that's not perishable, but an imperishable seed. There is no ultimate fate for us in terms of destruction. It's ultimate glory. And that's what Peter's trying to get at here this morning. So again, I want to, let me just kind of restate what, we've, what I've tried to communicate to, to this morning. Again, Jesus stands up and reads Isaiah 61. Jesus makes a declaration that these things are being fulfilled. The release to captives, the freedom to prisoners you know, taking this, these ashes and restoring them, all the things that we read in Isaiah 61. And next week, we'll also read Isaiah 35 as an example of other things that Jesus was making clear claim and backing it up with authority. But here's Jesus now engaging, saying, okay, I'm proclaiming liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. The first step was to address the unseen realm and the influences of this fallen created being the adversary. And in doing so, we see some profound encounters. 
And I want to make this last statement before we close this morning. And it's simply this. People ask all the time, well, does this really happen anymore? Are, is there really demonic possession still? I've got to be honest with you. I haven't seen it much, but I have seen it enough. And close dear friends of mine, especially on the mission field, where there are places of great idolatry and other things of, of powerful influences. And again, I, I have dear friends uh, on the mission field who've seen people levitate and fly across rooms and some very extraordinary supernatural things. One of my dear precious friends, Brent Napton, who uh, does much in the Middle East, he and his wife Michelle are headed back to the Middle East and uh, he's, a, he's a rice engineer. <laughs> and I made, told some of you the stories. And he said, look, I, I know a lot about force and gravity and all these other things. And I've seen the, all those physics thrown out the door when it relates to demonic possession. And, uh, and let me tell you something. It's very real. I've had multiple encounters in my own life with the demonic. But it's not, you know, if you think of Jesus' ministry as going out and shaking the bushes... He was terrifying the demonic, so it's not a surprise that the demonic were manifesting themselves so powerfully during the ministry of Jesus. So some would say, well, there is no more demonic possession. Jesus conquered that. I don't think that's the case. I think there is demonic possession, but I don't see it, certainly not like I see it in the book of Acts or even in the New Testament Gospels uh, with Jesus and his ministry or even the Acts of the early apostles. But what I do see clearly is the profound influence of Satan's activities and the demonic realm on human behavior. And I think it becomes very, very clear uh, that there is some kind of force behind some of the inexplicable things that occur among human beings. The way we treat others, the way that we treat the animal, uh, uh, the animal uh, world, the way, that the, the way that we treat the planet, the way we, we do it carelessly. And there has to be something so influential and motivating behind much of that activity that from my perspective, this answer of an unseen force set against humankind is very clearly the best explanation and uh, to me, all the materialistic views of this fail. Because from an evolutionary perspective, it just doesn't make sense. Much of this activity does not make sense at all. So anyway, I hope this morning again was a little bit, uh, it helped you see, it's not just about saying I believe. Well, the demons do that. What is it about? It's about a personal walk with the, the creator of your soul. So maybe some of you say, I, I don't know that I've really entered that. I've talked about belief or I've, I've quoted a creed or I've said a prayer years ago, but I don't know about this process of belief to purification to love. I, I haven't really seen that evidenced in my life. Well, maybe this morning you can start that, not just by saying something, but by truly embracing and making a decision to change the course of your life. And that would be, that would be our admonition to you. So get a hold of us here at Church at the Red Door if you're part of the online community and, and send us an email. Some, we'll, somebody will respond. We will begin the process of prayer with you. We will help walk you through, find you a community. I mean, whatever it is, we want to see you walk through belief and purification, baptism, salvation, belief, purification, and then ultimately where you move into a position where your life could actually be defined by love rather than a complicity with what we see here in the New Testament, which is pretty profoundly demonic. All right. Hey, we love you. Let me just close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for my friends. Uh, help us. Give us insight into your word, Lord. Uh, there was, there's a lot that we unpacked this morning, and we will continue to walk through this next week. Lord, you did. Jesus, you came to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. And you do have ultimate authority. Over the unseen realm, Lord, you can get Satan off of our back. You can limit his influence in our life through clothing us in your righteousness. And Father, clearly you have complete authority over the physical realm. Lord, we bow before you. We, like the demonic, shudder at your authority and power. 
But rather than turning your back on us because of ultimate failure, you have your arms wide open for us. We are fallen human beings, Lord, but for those who would embrace you and follow you and live into your, live into your words, Lord, not only do you have restoration, but you have an invitation into a family. And for that, we will worship you for all of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, have a great week. We love you, Church at the Red Door community and our online community. And uh, can't wait again. We, we continue to work very diligently to find a place to regather at some point. We're hoping early fall, maybe even a little bit during the summer. We'll see how it unfolds. And we love you very much. Have a great week.